Welcome to the UP Notable Books Club, brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. Tyler R. Tischler is the author of 21 books, including When Teddy Came to Town, Haunted Marquette, and the Marquette Trilogy. His latest book, Kabagam, a biography of Ojibwa chief Charles Kabagam, Tyler is also a professional editor and the owner of Superior Book Productions. So welcome to our 10th installment of the UP Notable Books Book Club. And we are delighted tonight to have Tyler Tischler with us. Wave Tyler to the crowd in case people don't know you. Okay. And he will be speaking here shortly. <laughs> Before he speaks, we've got, of course, an announcement, a little bookkeeping. Next month, Craig, do you want to give us a little commercial about your book? Oh, Craig's going to unmute. I'm here. Nope, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, I had to start. I had to uh, start reading it again because I. Uh, <laughs> it's been a couple of years since I saw since I read it. So, yeah, great. Yeah, I really appreciate this format. It's excellent. I'm really looking forward to Tyler's uh, presentation. So, I'll 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 just copy his presentation for next month. So, okay. <laughs> Good. All right. But yeah, we we were just talking. Your ears were probably buzzing because we were talking a little bit about it before you came on. And those members who've read it said it's really good and That's a little cool. scary, I guess. A little scary in the beginning. Yeah. Spots. <laughs> yeah. Well, that works well for this time of year. So that's going to be coming. Um, are we November 9th? I think it is. I don't 11th. Know. November 11th. So that will be Craig for Dead of November. And then if you have it, so go out and buy a copy or check it out from your local library. And if if you haven't done so, this is going to be December. You could do the same. This one might be a little trickier to get. Um, I know if you have trouble finding, I don't think this one's on Amazon. Am I right, Victor? I haven't been able to find it on Amazon. No, no, I think it's you, not there. You want, how I got a copy, contact Michigan Tech's bookstore. Yep, they got it. So if you can't find it from your library and you want a copy, just call the bookstore at Michigan Tech. This one's a little harder to get your hands on, but it looks like a pretty good thorough book all about hockey up there in Houghton. Okay, so I have one more announcement for those of you who've just popped on. I'm going to try to share my screen and show you something exciting. So here we go. Um, for those of you who do, uh, you read your books online through Libby or the Great Lakes Digital Library, my good friend up there, Jeremy Morlock, has been doing an outstanding job trying to get all our UP Notable books on, and he's gotten quite a few of them. So not all of them have been able to get on for different copyright reasons, and some of the authors, you know, apologize for that, but at least we have quite a few books right here, and the book we're going to be reading tonight, there it is, Kabagam, Kabagam, I, I never say it right, but anyways, there it is. So if you want, you can look at all these books and read them here online. So I'm gonna stop my share. And Victor, our president has got a few announcements. So take it away, Victor. Thank you. I'll just do a brief uh, screen share here. Uh, start that. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Yes. Beautiful. R right. This is a, the five volume set of the UP Reader. And it's my way of reminding you that uh, if you've ever wanted to write or be a writer, we are currently accepting submissions for the UP Reader up until November 15th this year. So all you have to do is uh, join UPA as a member at uppaa.org. And uh, I've posted the link in the, in the uh, comment in the chat room. So you can uh, have a look at the submission guidelines. We'll publish anything of any genre. You like poetry, short stories, uh, childhood, crazy childhood stories. Those are our favorites. Uh, we've even had science fiction, all kinds of stuff. The only limit is it has to be 5,000 words or less. And it has to be the first time in print. And uh, those are the main requirements. You can submit up to three stories. And we would love to uh, to see your work and uh, you can become part of the UP Reader legacy. So thanks for that, Evelyn. No, that five volume set, is that something that you're, you're selling? 
Yeah, it's on uh, Amazon Kindle for nine ninety five. It's it's a crazy deal. It's like sixty or seventy percent off. Fantastic. So, there, there's a yeah. Christmas gift idea for those of you who haven't got UP reader already. All right, and without any further ado, I would like to introduce my good friend Tyler Tischler. If you have not read his books before, I I I, I love. The three book set. What is what is the name of your trilogy? This is a the market trilogy. I love that one. That's a great place to start. I've read many other of Tyler's books, both fiction and nonfiction. But yeah. did you read that? Talking to us about his book Kabaga, mm -hmm. the chief, the man, the chief, the legend, the chief, the man, the legend. So thank you Tyler, for joining us tonight. <laughs> I give up. I, I really do. Tyler, Tyler, you're big. It's really hard to hear you. You're all scratchy again. That's better. No. No. My camera is not launched properly. Okay. All right. Carolyn, we can hear you. And Tyler, I'm not sure why you're coming in so scratchy. <laughs> I, I think you might have to, wouldn't you say, Victor? All right, I'll do that. Yeah. I don't know what that means, honey. It's just like little things. Hopefully his, uh, his audio will turn around in just a few seconds. Let's hope so. So everyone, let's just bear with Tyler for a minute. We had, we're having a little technical difficulty on his part, but hopefully this will help. Because it just sounds a little bit um, alien esque. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good one. Yeah, so that'll be great. Is that, is that Sharon? Huh? That's Sharon, and she can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I, for some reason, my video won't start. Oh, but... and that's Carolyn. Well, technically. <laughs> Well, Carolyn, can you hear and see us? Yeah. I can see you. So you guys will be here. So okay. It just says when I hit start video, because it's X'd out, it says your camera is not launched properly. Please check browser media permission. Mm -hmm. Whatever and that means. Well, we can, as long as you can hear us and see us, that'll be good. And yeah. Tyler, you want to try talking? Yeah. How is that sound now? So much oh, better. Yeah. Right. Okay, good. All right. I will go back to launching my PowerPoint and uh, we will go from there. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay, so this, this is obviously the book cover Kabagam, the Chief, the Legend, the Man. And I'm just going to kind of give you a rundown of a short biography of his life for those of you who haven't read the book and those who have um you know most of this you'll know but some of the pictures maybe you'll you'll you know will will trigger some questions or ideas for you um most of you if you've been to mark kent you're familiar with where his grave is located at Presque Isle Park. And this is the sign at the grave, which says uh, Charlie Kabagam lived from 1799 to 1902. Um, he's considered the last chief of the Chippewa or Ojibwa, which is the French word for Chippewa, which is the British word. Um, and his wife was Charlotte Kabagam. We don't know when she was born, but she died in 1904. She was the daughter of Chief Majikisik. And Prescott was their home for many years and into eternity. Now, because of this sign, every this is probably the thing everybody knows about Chief Kabaga. He lived to be 103. He lived in three centuries, and they've you know it's a lot of 
attention has been made about that, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the truth behind that and where that idea comes from and why I don't think it's true. And it all really kind of boils down to this man here, Peter White, who um, was Kabagam's very good friend. And most of you will probably know Peter White's name from the library in Marquette that he helped to um, use the benefactor for. But Marquette was founded in 1849. And Kabagam was here in 1849 when Peter White arrived. And Peter White, he was only uh, 19 at the time, but he could speak Ojibwa. And uh, Kabagam only spoke Ojibwa, he didn't speak English. So Peter White was able to make conversation with him. And for lack of anything else to say, he didn't know what else to ask. He, he asked Kabagam, how old are you? And Kabagam said, I'm 50 years old. And so since it was the year 1849, Hence, we have the year 1799 as the year that Kabagam was born. Now, I actually think he was born much later than that. Uh, the Ojibwe were not good at keeping track of their ages or keeping track of the passage of time. Um, he claimed, when he talked to Peter White, he claimed that he had lived so many years at Sault Ste. Marie, so many years in Tequamanon, so many years in Ontario, and those numbers all added up to 50 years. Um, but the truth of the matter is that he was probably born much later than that. Um, this, this is a, a family tree of, of Kabagam's family. Um, he is there in the middle of the screen, if you can see my pointer. And if you look at this chart, um, you can see up here his father and then his father's brothers listed over here, his grandfather and his great-grandfather. And what this chart shows us is that he was part of the Crane clan. The, the Ojibwe are divided up into numerous clans and the Crane clan was considered the chief clan or the head clan. And Kabagam's great-grandfather had been known as the Great Crane, who's the, the head chief. And Kabagam's uh, uncles, his father, his stepfather was over here Later, his brothers and Kabagam himself and also his father-in-law, they were all chiefs of some degree or other among the Ojibwa. Um, when Kabagam was a child, and you can see here, I think he was born in 1816. I'll explain why in a minute. But um, when he was a child, his uncle, uh, Shinga Bawasan, was the head chief at the Sioux. And this is a picture of his uncle, which is obviously a drawing. We don't have any photographs of him. Um, what happened, that we, the reason why we think Kabagam was born about 1816, maybe 1817, was his earliest memory was of his uncle walking down the street in the Sioux wearing a British uniform. And that British uniform he had gotten from fighting in the War of 1812. The Ojibwa were aligned with the British in the War of 1812 against the Americans. And uh, the uncle that fought, if you go back to the family tree, it's his uncle here, Sasabwa. He was a war chief at the Sioux. And he had another brother listed here, I won't try to pronounce his name, but um, that brother died at the Battle of the Thames in Canada during the War of 1812. And Sasaba um, in 1820 decided to put on his British uniform to show the Americans that he didn't like them, that he liked the British better, even though the Americans had won the War of 1812. And the Ojibwa were very upset that the Americans had won. So what happened in 1820 is that this man here, Lewis Cass, who was the governor of the Michigan Territory before Michigan was a state, he came up to the Sioux with the intention of building a fort, which would become Fort Brady, and also to explore the Lake Superior region um, find out if there were minerals up here. He actually went as far as to Ontonagon to go see the Ontonagon boulder. Um, but when he arrived at the Sioux, accompanied by Henry Schoolcraft, whose name a lot of you will recognize, and several other people, um, he met with the local Ojibwe chiefs, including Kabagam's uncles, and explained to them that the Sioux and all of Upper Michigan belonged to the United States, not Britain anymore, and he wanted to build a fort there. And the Ojibwa said they knew nothing about any treaties allowing 
Michigan or the United States to own their land. And he said, well, it doesn't really matter. It's our land. We want it, but we're going to pay you for it anyway because we're, we're nice people. And uh, he tried to negotiate with the Ojibwa. And Kabagam's uncle Sasaba got really angry, um, kicked some things that Tass had brought as presents and stormed out of the meeting, went off to his wigwam, pulled out a British flag and hung it up on his wigwam. And Cass was just absolutely furious about this and stormed over to the wigwam, tore down the British flag and said, if you try that again, I will stomp on your necks and destroy you, basically. And so everybody thought, oh, great, we're going to have a war here at, at Sault Ste. Marie. Um, supposedly, the, the, the women, the Ojibwe women and their children all got into canoes and they paddled down the rapids to get away before violence started. And Kabaga may have been one of those, those children that went into one of those canoes to try to get away before the Americans and the Ojibwe went at it. Um, it turns out that at the Sioux, there was a woman, uh, Susan Johnston, who was actually Ojibwa herself. She was the daughter of a chief in Wisconsin. And she convinced the Ojibwa chiefs not to go to war with the Americans. She basically convinced them that, you know, yes, there are enough of us that we could defeat them since the Cass's party was relatively small, but she explained to them that if we do kill them, more Americans are going to come and they're going to kill us. So we might as well just make peace. And so they signed a treaty and basically gave up some land at the Sioux. And Cass agreed that he would not build Fort Brady at the Sioux. But a year later, Fort Brady was erected. And so hence the American takeover of the Sioux. And that, that is uh, really the the pivotal first moment of Kabagam's life, his first memory, seeing his uncle wearing that British uniform. And I would guess he was probably three or four years old. That's about the time most of us have our first memories, the first things that we can remember from our lives. So um, right at the start, Kabagam's life is about uh, Native Americans having to cope with Americans taking over their land. Now, prior to that, uh, Upper Michigan, the Great Lakes area, had belonged to the British. The British had won it from the French. Um, the French had been the first ones to claim it. And then during the French Indian War in the 1750s, 1760s, the British had taken over. And now the British had been thrown out and the uh, Americans had taken over. Of course, the British still owned Ontario and Canada, everything north of us. And so a lot of the Ojibwe were very upset with the takeover by the Americans. And so they eventually would migrate up into Ontario. And at one point, Kabagam himself would, would do that. So here you have a map of uh, the Upper Peninsula and it's, it shows the different parts of the Upper Peninsula and how it was ceded over to America by the, uh, by the Native Americans. And so this little patch up here around Sault Ste. Marie was the, was the property that Cass took over in 1820. Um, pretty much the whole eastern half of the UP was seated in 1836. And then the rest of the UP, most of it in 1842. What I find fascinating is that Michigan becomes a state in 1837, which includes all of the Upper Peninsula. And in half of the Upper Peninsula, they haven't even purchased from the Ojibwe yet. So that just kind of shows you, um, you know, Michigan pretty much decided it was their land, whether they technically owned it or not at that point. Um, this is a map showing a lot of the places that Kabagam lived. Um, he actually was born at Grand Island, either on the island or right across from the island. His father, as I said, was a, was a chief. Um, he was the chief there at Grand Island. There was another chief um, at the Sioux who came to visit to go hunting at Grand Island, fell in love with Kabagam's mother, and she decided to leave her husband and go with him. That was Chief Shawano, who was from the Sioux. Um, so she went to the Sioux with Shawano, and she brought Kabagam and his uh, younger brother with her. 
And after that, Kavagam uh, grew up at the Sioux from that point on. Um, later, he would go on and live at Tequamanon. He had another uncle who was the chief at Tequamanon. And then eventually, um, he would go over to Ontario for several years and live. His father eventually went over to live in Ontario, and so Kabagam followed him there. And then in time, he would come over to uh, the Marquette area. Um, the, the way it turned out that he would end up in Marquette goes back to the discovery of iron ore. So this is uh, Philo Everett, the founder of the Jackson Iron Company. And Everett had heard about um, the copper in the Upper Peninsula, and he came up here looking for copper. Um, at the Sioux, he met a Native American woman who was uh, a cousin of uh, Charlotte, well, who would be Charlotte Kwagam, Kwagam's wife. And um, they eventually led him to Marquette County and the Teal Lake area where they said that there was there were these shiny rocks that the white people wanted. They didn't, the, the Ojibwe didn't really understand the difference between copper and iron ore and the different minerals, or at least they didn't, um, the communication wasn't well enough for them to understand. And so they led him to Marquette County and told him about the iron ore there and, and Everett thought he was looking, he was gonna find copper, but he said he found the iron ore. Um, Chief Majidisic actually led him to the iron ore at Teal Lake, and um, as a result, of course, there were mines that opened up in, in Nagani, and then Marquette had to be founded as a result um, to be the harbor town that the ore was shipped out of. And uh, this is a picture that is allegedly Chief Majidisic. Um, it isn't actually him. There are many photos of Native Americans from the UP that have been mislabeled, that people have claimed are Majikisic or Kabagam or different Native Americans. Uh, this is one that has claimed to be Chief Majikisic, but the truth of the matter is that it's not him, and there probably is no photo of him because he died about 1862, and there were no photographers established in the UP at that point. There were people that came up here and took photos, but there was no one with a photography studio and this looks like it was taken in a photography studio. So we probably don't have a photo of him. But he was, he was the chief here of Marquette County. Um, he usually resided uh, along the Pine River, sometimes the Carp River. And he had a daughter, um, Charlotte, who uh, ended up marrying Kabaka. She said that they met at the Sioux, they were married by a priest, and indeed that was true. I actually found their marriage record after a great deal of searching. Um, they were married there in 1845, and they were living at the Sioux when uh, Kabagam decided to come to Marquette. And how that came about is that Robert Braverett, who was involved with another um, of the early mining companies, he basically hired Kabagam to come to Marquette before Marquette existed and set up there and be there to help assist with the founding of Marquette. So this is a, a recreation of the first landing at Marquette. There was actually a much larger boat. There were 18 people in the boat that came, including Robert Graverett and Peter White. And Kabagam was already there. He, was, he had probably been there um, maybe a year or more before Marquette was officially founded. He had a wigwam there on the shore, uh, down probably near where Founders Landing is in Marquette today. And when he saw the boat coming in, he went out and he grabbed a hold of it and helped to pull the boat ashore. And that's how he met Peter White. And they became friends um, ever since then. And this is, a, this is a picture of what Marquette looked like in the early, probably about 18, uh, I want to say about 1855, 56, 57, somewhere in there. Um, we can, oops, sorry, we can date it to at least around 1857 because of the, this building here. This is the original courthouse, the little tower there in the background. And we know that was built in 1857. And you can see already they had some, some ore docks, some, well, some docks here for boats, and then this right here may have been the first, the first ore dock that the boats would have 
come on and they would shovel the ore onto the boats. Um, initially, there was a, a, a plank road that went from Marquette out to, the, out to the mines, and they had mules that would pull these carts from the mines to, to Marquette. Then they would have to dump the ore out of the carts, shovel all the ore onto the boats, and then the boats would, would carry it off. And so this is this is before there was a pocket dock. The, the first pocket dock would be in 1857. So this is probably right about the time they were building the, the first pocket dock. And um, yes. I'm gonna interrupt you. I called um Superior Land who helped set up our Zooms. Mm -hmm. And they said they get this problem with the feedback. If there's somebody else in your house logged in and they're not muted, could that be the case? No, I'm here all by myself. Okay, well then keep going because we get feedback. It's not as bad as it was. We can okay. hear it, but I was just trying to make it a little bit better for the listeners. So okay. Okay, keep going then. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, hopefully it'll get better. Um, so come on. Uh, before all of this was built, and we're talking 1849, 1850, 51, Kavagam was living down here by the shore in his wigwam. Uh, Chief Bajagisic had some sisters who also had a wigwam or a lodge, and a lot of the, the white miners or the early settlers to Marquette stayed with the Native Americans during this time. It is said that uh, Kabagam and his father-in-law, Marjagisic, really were responsible for helping the community to survive through the winter because they would go out hunting and, and find game and just kind of help provide for them over that time. And uh, there's actually a quote in the mining journal from what is said to be a prominent Marquette citizen who talks about the great debt that he feels that they, they owed to Kabaga to keep Marquette actually running in the early years. It's also said Kabaga uh, cut down the first tree for the first road that was built to the mines. And he's, he was considered the first resident of Marquette at the time. Um, meanwhile, back at the Sioux, because of the uh, discovery of the iron ore and the amount of iron ore that they were shipping out of Marquette, they decided to build the Sioux locks so that they wouldn't have to portage the boats anymore. They could actually go straight from one lake into the next lake without having to load and unload boats to try to get around the dealing with the different levels of the, of the Great Lakes. And so this is a picture of the Sioux locks being built. This is Charles Harvey, who Harvey, Michigan is named for, up here in the corner. He was the mastermind behind building the locks. And of course, uh, I mean, the Sioux locks are a wonderful thing. We can all here in Upper Michigan appreciate that they were built, but in order to build them, they went through and just basically kicked the Native Americans off of their land, dug right through Native American burial grounds to build the locks, and, you know, basically paid, them, paid the natives off to get them to leave. So it was really quite a, a horrendous experience for the Native Americans. Um, meanwhile, back to Marquette, uh, the Native Americans, um, as, as Marquette started to grow, they kind of became more marginalized. This photograph here was taken at Lighthouse Point, which is just kind of off to the side of, of downtown Marquette, if you know where the Lighthouse in Marquette is. Um, the natives moved over to that area and they were encamped around the Lighthouse. This is a wigwam that belonged to Kabagam's uh, brother-in-law, Jack Lapete. And uh, you can see here is Kabagam sitting down here on the side in the photo. Unfortunately, I, I think this is Jack Lapeak here. Um, unfortunately, we don't know who the rest of the Native Americans are. But they, they kind of wanted to, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say they were, they were pushed away or, or marginalized because I think they really wanted to continue to live their traditional lifestyle. But at the same time, at this point, they realized that their economy was going to largely depend upon the white people coming to town. And they were, they were usually employed um, by white people in different, different uh, manners. And so the, the two were kind of dependent on each other, but at the same time, they wanted to live far enough away that they could 
live their own live their own lifestyle. So they were at Lighthouse Point. Later, they would they would move around, and eventually, um, they would end up in North Marchant or out at Prestel Park. Um, this is Kabakam's brother-in-law. I'm just going to talk briefly about a few of his family members who are interesting. Um, this is Jack Lepie or Lepic, or uh, however you want to pronounce it. His his real name is Francis Nolan. Um, Homer Kidder, who lived in Marquette, appearingly named him Jacques Lepic, which means the Jack of Spades, and the Americans bastardized it into Jack Lepite. Um, he was a very interesting man. Um, among other things, he went up to the Arctic to go hunt for seals with his father. He actually was very... Uh, he traveled quite a bit more than Kabagam ever did. He went off to Washington, D.C. with a group of Native Americans from Wisconsin. They traveled all around the country doing um, like uh, ceremonial dances to try to raise money so they could get to Washington, D.C. And when they got there, uh, they met with the president. There was a big dinner at the White House. Um, and basically what they were trying to do was get the president or Congress to agree to give them their land, to agree to, to honor the treaties that have been passed. None of that happened, but regardless, uh, Lepic went several times to Washington as a translator for the Native Americans trying to help them uh, to, get their, to get their rights. Uh, this is supposedly a picture of Charlotte Kabagam, Kabagam's wife, but again, it's not really her. It's actually, I believe, Mrs. Lou, who was a Native American at Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, we've, this, this picture has been seen zillions of times staying at Charlotte Kabagam because somebody just decided for the heck of it, they needed a picture of Charlotte Kabagam. So here it was, and it got promoted to staff for decades. Um, but it really is not possible to be her because we know she was born about 1830. Um, this picture was taken much later than that. She did not have any children after 1860. Um, so it, it just, and she, she looks way too young to, for this to be a picture of her in her 30s in this, in this photo. So I, I talk more in the book about a lot of these photos and who they may actually be and why they're not who they claim to be. Um, so if you're interested, there's an appendix in, in my book about that kind of stuff. We do have pictures of Charlotte, though. Um, this is Charlotte here, sitting in the middle. And above her, it, you can see standing Charles Kabagam. And again, unfortunately, we don't know who the rest of these people are. Um, this is probably their encamping out at maybe at Crestile Park, possibly. Um, this is also one of the more fascinating parts of Kabagam's story. This is Honorable John Logan Chipman, who was a U.S. congressman and was actually Kabagam's brother-in-law. Uh, he married Kabagam's sister, Lizette. He was at the Sioux, and he apparently fell in love with the woman, with a woman um, who decided instead to go marry one of the officers at Fort Brady. And so his heart broke, and he then met Lizette, and he married her. And they moved downstate, um, down to the Detroit area where he was involved in politics and he was a lawyer and they had a bunch of children. She unfortunately died quite young, um, but he went on to be in the U.S. Congress and he did a lot to try to fight for um, the Native Americans' rights. I don't know how much contact he actually had with Kabagam, but he stayed in touch with Kabagam's half-siblings. Lizette was one of uh, Kabagam's half-siblings. And so I, I find it fascinating that, um, you know, that Kabagam actually had a brother-in-law who was white and a U.S. congressman of all things. Mm -hmm. Half-brother Chief Shawano, who, who was uh, probably the one that stayed the closest in touch with uh, Honorable Mr. Chipman, um, Shawano was supposed to succeed his father, Chief Shawano, as the chief at the Sioux. Um, there was a treaty in which it was agreed that uh, Shawano's, Chief Shawano's son would be educated at a college. And so Edward was that son. He was sent down to Lower Michigan. He went to different colleges. Um, 
I think Adrian was the was the college that he graduated from. He was going to become a lawyer. But before that happened, he was up at the Sioux on a ship that got trapped in the ice. And so he and the other people on the ship to pass the time until they could get out of the ice, decided to play cards. Someone accused him of cheating at cards. He got really mad and pulled out a knife and went after the other guy. And that guy bit off his nose. And so he, his nose looks very flat here. Anyway, it meant that he had lost all his beauty. And so he was kind of ashamed to show his face after that in public. And so he stayed at the Sioux and uh, just eventually became the chief there. And uh, stayed in touch with, with uh, Mr. Chipman, who did a lot to try to help him out. So let me just get a drink here. <laughs> How is the sound? Is it any better? No, we have feedback. I don't know. I was wondering if, um, like I, I wrote in the chat, if someone suggested maybe if we all muted ourselves, that might help. And then I was wondering even maybe Tyler, I don't know what, what your volume is on your computer. I wonder if that has something to do with it. But when I called Superior Land, their only idea was that there was maybe another computer on in your house somewhere. They say when that happens, then you get this terrible feedback. Should I, should I turn the volume up? Does that make any difference to you? Um, okay. Is that I the volume? I put it up. Is it better? No. Was no. it all the way down before? Um, it was like, well, it was a little bit farther down. I can put it down more. How, how was that? Yeah, it doesn't really seem to be making any difference that I can tell. So I don't know. We can do good, but there is feedback. Okay. Well, I'll just keep going. And yeah. All right. It's a technical difficulty. I don't know really how to solve it, but yeah. okay. Thank you, though, Tyler, right. for talking. Yeah. Okay. So this is um, one of the most important parts of the Kabagam's life was uh, their trial that they had against the Jackson Iron Company. And if you remember, I said that um, Maja Gisek had led the the Philo Everett and the other men from the Jackson Iron Company to where the iron ore was discovered near Teal Lake. And as a result of that, the Jackson Iron Company gave him a certificate saying he owned so many shares in the Jackson Iron Company. And Marja Giesa kept this certificate in a little box and he took it with him everywhere. And he, he treasured this. He thought it was very important. And after he died, Charlotte inherited the certificate and she went to Philo Everett and said, you know, can we get some money for this? My father is supposed to have these shares. Where's the money that these shares equate with? Well, the Jackson Iron Company had actually gone bankrupt and been rebought and uh, reorganized. And so um, Philo Everett tried to help Charlotte, but the, the, the company, the reorganized company, wanted nothing to do with it. They tried to buy him off and give him like 50 bucks to give her. And he said, no, that's not fair. It's worth more than that. So Charlotte had this, um, she decided to go to court. And she hired a lawyer in Marquette, Mr. Clark. And they went to court and tried to get her money. There, it actually ended up going to the Michigan Supreme Court. The case was uh, at one point dismissed and then came back again. Um, the Jackson Iron Company tried to claim that because the company had been reorganized, they didn't owe anything to the shareholders of the original company. Um, they also, it was a landmark case because they tried to argue that Chief Majagisic had had multiple wives and Charlotte's mother may not have been the legitimate wife or the first wife and therefore she was not legitimate and therefore she was not his heir. And ultimately, after all of this trouble with the, with the court system, in the end, they decide, the courts decided that they could not judge the case based on white marriage laws and white customs and you know there were no marriage certificates back then for the Ojibwa and so they decided that the Ojibwa's customs were legitimate and, and um, should therefore be honored. So Charlotte won the case 
Um, the Jack Sparrow Company had to pay her out money. And the question remains, did she actually get the money or not? There does not seem to be any clear documentation that she got the payout that she was promised. There's different theories that have been floated around the years. Um, I looked, I could not find any proof that she had the money, but there was a document I found where um, she was actually one of several heirs. She had, Charlotte had a sister and the sister had died, but the sister had children and grandchildren. And so those were all also Margie Gizek's heirs. So all of his descendants basically were, had a right to this money. And so there is a paper that shows that Charlotte went to court again to have her sister's granddaughter be granted a guardianship to Mr. Clark, the lawyer, in case anything happened to Charlotte so that he would be able to protect Mary's money, which makes me believe that Charlotte did indeed get the money. What became of the money after that, I don't know, but I believe that the Kabagams actually did uh, did receive the money at some point and probably, you know, probably spent it as, as the time went on. But it was, it's considered a landmark case because it actually honored Native Americans and their customs and, uh, you know, really helped to change how Native Americans were treated in the court system from that point on. Um, uh, people in Marquette, and this was uh, during the time that the trial was going on, um, Kabagam was was struggling financially and he complained to his friend Homer Kidder, or, or I'm sorry, Alfred Kidder one day, and Alfred Kidder decided, well, we will build Kabagam a house out at Presque Park, because every time Kabagam turned around, he built a house and somebody would come along and say, hey, you built it on my land, you got to leave. And so um, Alfred Kidder took up this fund, started this fund, and Peter White contributed and uh, John Longyear and other prominent people in Marquette to raise money to build a house for Kabagam at Presque Isle. And that happened in 1886, and this is the house here. And if you look, you can see Kabagam here with, uh, he has a cane in his hand here. I don't know exactly why this picture was taken. I don't know who all these other people are. I'm guessing that possibly it was uh, sort of like the grand opening of the Kabagam home. And so every, all these well-to-do people from Marquette came out here to sort of do a housewarming with Kabagam. Uh, strangely, I don't think Charlotte is in this picture, but um, you know, Kabagam definitely is. And so from 1886 on, Kabagam lived at, at Presque Isle Park. Um, by that point, Peter White had bought Presque Isle from uh, the U.S. government and decided to make it into a city park and allowed Kabagam to live there. And there were other Native Americans who also lived there. I don't know how many. I'm guessing it was a small community, maybe 20 at the most. Um, and so they, they were just uh, living out there for many years. The street, the house itself is located, was located where the ice cream stand is now at Fresco Park. They said that it was right near the end of the streetcar line and the streetcar went out to where the Shiras swimming pool used to be at Fresco, which was right by that ice cream pavilion. Um, this is a picture of Alfred Kidder, the man who was responsible for helping to build the house and was a good friend of Kabagam's. And then these are his sons. Um, the oldest here is Homer Kidder, who would be uh, very important in Kabagam's story going forward. And then this is um, Howard Kidder, who died kind of young. And then this boy with the curls is Alfred Kidder. And Alfred would go on to become a very important anthropologist in America in early, the early 1900s. And uh, Alfred Kidder was very interested in um, Native American studies. He had all kinds of lot of books in his house about Native Americans. Um, and so that got his, his children interested in as well. And so really the fact that Alfred Kidder was one of the great anthropologists of America is really very much linked to the fact that he, he or at least his brother, definitely knew Chief Kabago. Um, Homer Kidder in 1894 
was about 18, 19 years old. He had been going to Harvard, but he was ill. And so he decided to stay home for a year in Marquette. And he had the idea that he would go and write down all of the Ojibwe narratives, these oral histories that the Ojibwe told. And he was good friends with, uh, or at least his father was good friends with Kabagam's brother-in-law, Jacques Lepic. And so he approached Lepic and said, can I get you to tell me these stories? And Lepic spoke English. So Lepic said, sure, I'll be happy to do that. But um, Kabagam and Charlotte Kabagam, they actually know all kinds of great stories too. We should include them. And so Homer Kidder said, sure, let's do that. And so he and Lepic would go out to Presque Isle and meet with Kabagam and Charlotte Kabagam, who did not speak English. And they would write down all these all these stories. And so Kabagam would, would tell these stories in uh, Ojibwa. Lepic would translate them into English. And then Homer Kidder would write them all down by hand in a notebook. And so you can imagine that this had to be a very time-consuming process. And uh, Homer would have to probably stop Lepic and ask him, you know, can you explain that again? Or what is that word? Or what, is, what does that word mean in English? And so it, it would have taken quite a long time to do. But um, the result um, was, was a book called Ojibwe Narratives, which Homer had in manuscript his entire life, never published it. But it was published in the 1990s by um, Wayne State University Press. It's about 160, 70 pages long. And I, I think it's still available today to buy if you want to read all, all of those stories. But um, I think I think the Kabagams were probably very pleased to be included in this project. And they realized that their own world was passing away, the, the way the traditional lifestyle of the Native Americans, and that it was important that these stories got written down so that they would be preserved. And not only are these, you know, like legends and sort of Ojibwe type fairy tales, but also a lot of stories about Kabagam and his childhood and medicine men that he knew and, and things like that that give us some history. <laughs> Significant moments in Kabagam's life was uh, the building of the Father Marchette statue in 1897. <clears throat> The French Catholic Church in Marquette and the, the Jean de Baptiste Society in Marquette wanted to build a statue to Father Marquette since the town was named to Father Marquette. Um, but they didn't want it to just be a French and a Catholic thing. So they approached Peter White to help them with the funding. And Peter White wanted nothing to do with it because it was right during the time of the 1893 Depression. And he said, people don't have any money. We can't afford it. But eventually he changed his mind and he helped to fund this statue. It was built by Gitano Trentino, who was a sculptor from Italy but lived in Milwaukee. And Mr. Trentino came up to Marquette and did some drawings of the area and uh, tried to get some idea of what he wanted on the, on the sculpture. And he was introduced to Chief Kabagam by Peter White and he did some sketches of Kabagam. And so it said that one of the Native Americans on the friezes, which are on the sides of the statue here, is modeled on Chief Kabagam. Now, I've looked at him, I don't know which one it is, I can't tell. Um, the other thing is that it was claimed that uh, Trentino actually modeled the statue itself on Peter White. People said that's not Father Marquette, that's Peter White on that statue. <laughs> That was, that was the rumor. Um, Trentino later did a bust of Peter White, which is actually in the Peter White Public Library. And in the book, I have a picture of the bust next to the statue. And I don't really think that they, just, that they look alike myself. Um, what's interesting though also is that after Kabagam died, Peter White wanted to have another statue made of Kabagam and he hired Trentino again to do it. But it just never happened. The Trentino apparently did some sketches for the statue that he sent, but those have been lost. All I could actually find was a subscription form where Peter White was trying to raise money to build the statue. And I think only Peter White and Nathan Kaufman's names were on the subscription form. So I guess there wasn't enough interest in Marquette among other people to pay to have a statue to keep clocking, but 
I kind of secretly hope that because of my book, people will say, hey, that statue should have been built and somebody will take up the initiative to build that statue. <laughs> By the end of his life, the Bagham had really become sort of a tourist attraction in Marquette. Here he is riding in one of the St. Uh, Jean de Baptiste parades. He's right here in the back of the, of the boat on a float. Um, and he was a regular in the in the Fourth of July parades, which I find very ironic. That's why I have up here is American is apple pie, because I I think um, it's ironic that here you have a man whose uncles died. One of his uncles died fighting the Americans in the War of 1812. His ancestors were against the Americans taking over the UP, and yet suddenly. Um, He's in the 4th of July parade, as if, you know, he's the celebrated part of American history now. Um, here's some pictures of him out at Presque Isle. Um, this is taken with Lizzie Perro. The, uh, the Kabagams, at the end of their lives, they were taking care of these children, um, Frank and Lizzie Perro, and we, we're not sure if, if the children were related to them or not. They may have been the great-grandchildren of Charlotte Kabagam's sister, but there's no um, no paperwork that's really clear as to whether that was the case or not. But these pictures were taken around late 1890s, 1900. The photographer was the grandson of Philo Everett, and this is the photographer's bike round, or I'm sorry, his bicycle here in the background of this photo. And here is uh, Kabagam with the two children in the boat at Presque Isle. And this is another photo that was taken that day. He wanted to be photographed in his suit, but the photographer said, no, just wear what you're wearing. So they took this photo first, and then they took the one of him with the little girl in the suit. So he, he kind of wanted to you know, be more formal at the end. Um, Artists would come to, to uh, Presque Isle and they would have to paint him. So this is a painting that was done of him. Um, this is him wearing his regalia, which he only wore on, on occasion. But uh, his wife insisted that he put it on to be painted. So um, that happened. And then um, he died in 1902, uh, probably the age of 86, maybe, although people said 103. Um, his, his funeral was held at St. Peter's Cathedral. He and his wife had been married by a Catholic priest. I don't know to what degree they really practiced Catholicism. I could find no records about their Catholic uh, practices. I, I did actually contact the diocese and um, they were not able to find any proof that the Kabagams were like regular uh, attendees at St. Peter's Cathedral. Peter White paid for the funeral, and so I suspect Peter White had a lot to do with making sure that the funeral was held at St. Peter's, since it was the Catholic cathedral in Marquette. And this is what the cathedral would have looked like in 1902. Um, most of you know that there's the big towers, much taller towers on the cathedral, um, but the cathedral burned in 1935. It was rebuilt in the late 30s, and so the cathedral we have today is the rebuilt one. This is the earlier version of it. They took it after the funeral, they put his casket on a streetcar and brought it out to Presque Isle Park and buried him on the bluff. Um, that was all Peter White's doing. Peter White was the commissioner of parks in Marquette. So he decided Kabagam's going to get buried at Presque Isle Park. And he will be the he and his wife will be the only people ever allowed to be buried in the park. And this is his uh, his gravestone here. As I said, Peter White wanted to build a statue out there to commemorate Kabagam. That did not happen. Um, this stone, however, washed up on the shore at Presque Isle several years later. And so they decided that that would be the marker for Kabagam's grave. And this picture was taken about 1940. You can see they have all these stones around the bodies which are no longer there, but the marker and the rest of the stone is, is, is still there today. And at the, at the end of the book, I talk a lot about the Bogham's legacy and some of the um, many things that happened to commemorate him. This is a card that was issued right after he died in 1903 by the Marquette National Bank, which was, was quite short-lived. 
but you can see that they were trying to honor him. They made this uh, memorial coin here for him. But at the same time, you have to wonder why put his picture here on the bank card. Is it, it's sort of a using him for publicity. So he, be, he starts to become this sort of marketing icon. And even before he died, that was the case. Peter White had his picture on some, uh, um, I, I think they were napkins that he had printed for a bankers association meeting. And Peter Wright was always playing up how he was friends with the, with the local Indian chief. And so he becomes this sort of icon of Marquette, but also sort of used um, for commercial purposes. And in the book, I talk a lot about all the books that have been written, um, where Kabagam sometimes shows up as a character, all the places named for him, like Kabagam Lake out in, out in Chocolate. And uh, I think, you know, I, I feel like, you know, that's the end of the end of my slides and my presentation, but is it is it really the beginning? I'm hoping that my book, um, in telling Kabagam's story, it will just get more people interested in knowing the truth about um, not just Kabagam, but Native Americans in Upper Michigan and uh, just the, 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 the legacy of it. Because I, I myself, I grew up just kind of knowing a few facts about Kabagam, and I thought there had to be more to this story. And I just assumed, you know, the white people came to the UP and everything was hunky dory. The Native Americans welcomed us and we all lived peacefully together. And that really wasn't the case. Maybe there weren't any massacres here, but the Native Americans were definitely coerced into giving up their land. Um, they were often discriminated against. In fact, I think Kabagam, um, because of his friendship with Peter White, I think he was able to walk a fine line in Marquette. And I talk about that some of the book, but just kind of to keep the peace of Marquette and keep a small Native American community going here in Marquette, which was different than in other places of the UP where the Native Americans were actually on reservations. So I think it's a, you know, I think he's a fascinating person from, from that perspective as well. So I will, um, I will, I will stop there. I'll stop the share and I will let you guys ask me questions if you would like to. Does anybody have any questions out there? Hmm. Um, I just wanted to say, I think it's, um, it's Carolyn, you can't see me. Um, Les and I, you know, we're sitting here listening to this and it's really fascinating um, the research you did and how interesting I find that people just use photographs indiscriminately without even knowing who the people were uh, and that you figured that out. Um, but I mean, that was just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you have so much great information. Um, it's, it's really fun to, uh, and I love the maps, you know, what, what exactly, how, how we came to be um, part of the territory that's now Michigan, um, where the Native Americans actually um, had so much at stake. Um, and we took it over basically, mm -hmm. but thank you. Photos. Um, I think a part of the problem with the photographs is not photographed with a Native American. Oh, that's Chief Kabagam because for white people, the only Native American they knew of was Chief Kabagam. So, of course, it has to be Chief Kabagam. And I, I think that's really, you know, the pro part of the problem there that there's just this complete um, cluelessness that there are all kinds of Native Americans here, not just Chief Kabaga. It And it's just fun to see, you know, how you start out with um, a few Native Americans and people land in Marquette and start a town. I, I mean, I just, I love the story. Thank you very much. Tyler, Tyler, I like the part where you were talking about how uh, the chief uh, was called uh, as American as apple pie, but 
he and his the whole thing about them not really wanting to be Americans that was many probably decades prior to that. Yeah. Okay. So here's what I wanted to do is share with you something. I came across a quote, and it, it's from uh, the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian, which kind of explains what you just uh, said about that process. And here's what the quote is. The past never changes, but the way we understand it, learn about it, and know about it, it changes all the time. Yeah, that's good. that's a good quote. <laughs> Think a little bit. So to the truth, rather than farther into creating myths and legends about it. Do we have any other comments or uh, questions out there in our group? Okay, we've been getting some uh, words of thanks on the chat. Um, one thing I wanted to comment and comment on is it's uh, very well documented, Tyler. I think it, you do a nice job with the research and making sure where you know you got the research and and even at the end, all the different you know ways that we've maybe heard about him. I. My book club read a few years ago, Laughing Whitefish, which maybe some others in the crowd have read. So it was kind of neat to see how that, you know, tied in with your story. So thank you. And I always want to know, what is your next adventure? What are you writing now? problems. Um, the only thing I will say is that the Longyear family will probably play a role in it. Okay. And I'm also reading a book, of, another book about Gothic literature, English and French, French Gothic literature in this time, rather than British Gothic literature. Nobody in the UK will want to read, but I'm very interested in Gothic literature. So I'm, I'm going back and forth from, between the two of them as the historical fiction one gives me trouble. So I don't know when the next book will be out, but hopefully a year, two years of the longest. Okay. Well, thank you. And one thing I want to say, and this is maybe interesting to Victor especially, is this is our first UP Notable Books book club that is international. I know one of our viewers is there in Canada. Let's yes, go. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> so, so Tyler, you brought in an international crowd. I've been surprised at how many books I, of Kabagam I've seen have been sold in Canada. And I think I think that's wonderful that people are, are reading it. And I actually had hoped doing the research to get into Ontario and try to find more information about his years in Ontario. I do talk about a little bit in the book, but I don't know much about it. And unfortunately, there was a pandemic, so I didn't get to Canada. But... Uh, if there is more information about Kabagam anywhere, it's somewhere in Ontario, I think. I have a question about Presque Isle, because in yes. the book, there's Presque Isle that is near Porcupine Mountain um, uh, Park, and then there is Presque Isle, of course, in Marquette. So tell me about those two different Presque Isles that are mentioned. I really don't know much other than to say it, it is uh, French, that it means that the name is French, that means almost an island. Mm -hmm. It basically refers to a peninsula, and both of them were named by the French. So the French, for whatever reason, decided to give them both the same the same name, and the name has just, has just stuck. Um, sometimes here in Marquette, we'll have older people argue with you and claim that the name is Presqu'Isle and not Presqu'Isle. Um, my family's been in Marquette since it was founded, and everybody in my family says Presque Isle. So maybe Presque Isle is the correct French way to say it, but here in Marquette we say Presque Isle. Um, other, other than that, I, you know, I don't know. I've never even been to the other Presque Isle. So, but I, there are, I believe there are several Presque Isles along Lake Superior that you know the French named at different points. Mm -hmm. My high school French tells me it's Presque Isle, not Eel. 
<laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my French is not as good as it used to be, but uh, um, yeah, I, I prefer I own myself. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for coming in tonight to listen to Tyler and let's give him a hand. Yep. Thank, thank you all for coming. You're a great audience and I appreciate the questions and the comments. I can see the comments there. So thank you to Ann and Debbie and everybody else and have a wonderful night. Yep. And thank you. And thank you, Donna. I think you're absolutely right. I, I like that quote. You know, I mean, I think the past is the past, but we look at it different. We learn new things. And that's, that's pretty interesting when it comes to talking about, you know, history like this with Tyler's book. And thank I you. Was, okay, I'm going to pipe up one more thing. I was concerned about the sort of racism that the Americans came in to look at the First Nations or the Aboriginal people. And, you know, the French and the British were tolerant. They, they allowed people to live their lives. And I think it was when the Americans came in that really the racism and intolerance really took hold. Would, would you like to comment on that? Yes. That's very true. And I think the reason is that the French and the British, especially the Great Lakes area, they weren't so much interested in settling the land. They were interested in things like the fur trade. And so they were able to work with the Native Americans to um, help the economy, both in kind of as a benefit to both the both the natives and the Europeans. The Americans were different because the Americans had this idea of manifest destiny where they were going to march across the continent and take it over and they were going to settle everywhere. And part of the problem with the Native Americans was they had to decide, well, how are the Native Americans going to fit into this plan? Is it going to be assimilation or is it going to be removal? And assimilation being, we're going to teach all the Native Americans to farm and they're going to be just like us. Or we're going to marry them until all of that red blood gets disseminated so it's not even noticeable in people anymore over the generations. Um, if you think of Pocahontas, for example, she is an ancestor to Thomas Jefferson. And that's what they tried to do in Virginia much earlier in the 1670s, was intermarry with the Native Americans to sort of wipe them out over generations. Um, here in the it was a little bit different because in other areas of the country, the Native Americans were removed and sent farther west. And they wanted to give that to the Ojibwe, and they kept threatening to do it. But there were people like Bishop Verica who stood up to the American government and said no and bought property for the Native Americans. And uh, there, were, there were actually many others in the UP who said, we need the Ojibwe, they're integral to our workforce. And so they fought to kind of keep the Ojibwe here. Um, so that's one of the nicer things that you can say about the Americans in the Upper Peninsula as opposed to other areas. But uh, it really had to come down to the difference between just using the land versus settling on the land. And because the Americans want to settle here, the racism, I think, was much was much worse among Americans than Native Americans. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. And all right, everyone, we will see you. Don't forget um, the, the deadline there, November 15th. You've got a little time if you've got some writing in you and you want to try to submit something over to Victor for the UP reader. And um, thank you again, Tyler. And we'll see you all next month. Craig, especially. I hope you're coming. Okay. <laughs> for the talk on Dead of November, a novel of Lake Superior. Have a good evening. You've been watching the UP Notable Books Club, brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. To join or for more information, please visit us at www.upa.org or www.upnotable.com.